Hey guys, and welcome back to the Final Fantasy playthrough, where we're now in space! And since I didn't say it last time when I equipped the sun thing, sunlight yellow overdrive! Yes, I was actually serious when I said that Tom would be attacking enemies with the power of the sun. And we're fucking fighting manticores and all this shit, it's pretty awesome. I don't know how Manticore's got in space, but for what little you guys saw, yes, the flying fortress that the Lufinians made is actually a satellite, a giant mechanical, totally sci-fi satellite. Later versions would actually change this instead to be more of a flying castle in the clouds, you know, to make it more in line with high fantasy, but this was supposed to be one of the first really big plot twists of Final Fantasy was that despite the Lufinians wearing robes and having like laurel crowns and talking some weird ancient language, they actually made a satellite in space. Hmm. I am kind of disappointed that remakes would actually tone this down and would instead make it the castle, which I know Amano's original concept art shows it as an actual castle, but I think it's really cool and it's a lot more jarring that we're in a satellite, like a very sci-fi current technology setting after all of the, you know, caves and dungeons we've been going through. That kind of genre bait and switch would be used in a lot of RPGs over the course of, well, RPG history, I guess. I won't name names, otherwise that would be huge spoilers. Yeah, and I know there's some rendering issue, but there are supposed to be stars surrounding the satellite, but... The NES can be really fickle on what it wants to render correctly and what it doesn't. 1980 technology, go figure. Oh, so that's not just an emulator issue, then? Nah, even the NES itself will sometimes not render stars correctly. Fuck yeah, second ribbon. Who are you going to equip that to? I am going to give as many people as I possibly can a ribbon. I think this might actually be my third. They're literally just that important. So one guy is going to be ribbonless. So he's going to have to tie his hair back with like a scrunchie or some shit. Well, sucks to be you, Helldragon, I guess. <laughs> it might actually be Helldragon who doesn't get a ribbon. He's all grrr, dog, and that's why he's the one who terminated it. Exactly. And the reason I gave Cardo uh, the Thor hammer is because his Thor gauntlet was actually taking up an equipment slot in his armor. So because the Thor gauntlet and the Thor hammer both allow him to cast Thunder 2 spells infinitely, I'd rather give him the weapon that won't take up an inventory slot than give him the gauntlets and instead give him actual equipment that he can equip. Makes sense. Also, why is this thing not like Space Eye? You really couldn't give it like a recolor? They could have, but instead, once again, it's sort of like what Zelda does, where it throws in old mini-bosses as just random encounters. Uh. And to me, I like that. It shows a true gauge in your actual power. And that adamant is adamantium. Yes, what Wolverine has in his fucking claws. <laughs> I was gonna say. They decided to throw that in Final Fantasy, and it is very important. And in fact, it is specifically very important to Tom. Oh. Who also gets a pretty ribbon in his hair. Aww. Aww. Yep, lovely. But we're just trying to get as much good gear here. Um, there's also white robe and black robe, which are very good for specific mages. But for the most part, I really just want Rich and Cardo to have protect rings and the most powerful armlet they can get. The protect ring will obviously save them from instant death. And then all the other armor that I'm going to give them is just going to be max defense. I like how this isn't like... Some kind of malevolent demon. It's just a sentry robot doing its thing. Exactly. Once again, it's really doing that whole genre on its head. It doesn't make sense in the later versions when it's just a castle in the sky. When you have an actual sci-fi technological satellite, sentry robots make a lot of sense. The robot in the waterfall who probably fell from the satellite makes sense. Mm. Like... I get why they were trying to do it. It's like, well, modern gamers are used to this sort of tropes and stuff, but when it throws off so many things that the game had already put together that were actually cohesive, then it's a problem. And it's definitely an issue other than how much easier the game is with the remakes. That's another thing that RPGs like to do, and again, not naming names. It's an ancient civilization. Were they super advanced for whatever reason? Oh, they were able to build robots. Problem solved. To be fair, Star Wars happens long, long ago. 
in a galaxy far, far away, yeah. Yeah, that's how you're able to do that. Well, if they can master space travel, I'm sure they could mass produce C-3PO's. I do like the music too, I like how this gets its own dungeon music. Um, the Earth Cavern and Golic Volcano both had the Golic Volcano music, which was later remake in Final Fantasy IX, which was amazing. I love that remix. I love how they actually bring back Golic Volcano. And of course, the Sunken Shrine had the Chaos Shrine music. But the Flying Fortress gets its own super, very techno y theme. It's no Echnor Fortress from Thousand Year Door, but I can dig it. Yeah, it, it's very, very, very simple, which I like with it, because especially it goes together with the background, how it's just simple stars. And this is another plot point, too. We're seeing that the energy is all collecting at the Chaos Shrine, which is a big theme in this game of cycles and things going back to the beginning. Hmm, so sounds a bit like what happened in the city, uh... Dissidia is the backstory of Final Fantasy to a huge extreme. You find out who Garland originally is, what Garland's backstory is. Dissidia is based off the plot of Final Fantasy. I actually really like it if it wasn't for the fact that if you play Dissidia, you know more about the backstory of Final Fantasy 1 than actually playing Final <laughs> Fantasy 1. Oh, that's pretty crazy. I have to say, I don't want to take the seriousness out of this space station malarkey, but... I didn't see the first O in this thing's name to begin with. Oh no, we're actually fighting giant nachos, and it's Aww. glorious. If only Richie and Cardo could conjure up some beer, then we could have nachos and beers in space, and Final Fantasy would be the perfect video game. But no, now they're dead. You ate all the nachos, Hell Dragon. what the hell is wrong with you? You didn't share. You're supposed to be on a diet, man, what the hell? <laughs> So this floor is kind of a dick move. This floor actually is just a bunch of repeating rooms. Not even rooms, but a bunch of repeating floors that you have to eventually figure out that from the starting position, you have to go down to right to. But if you don't do that exactly, it will repeat. And you can get stuck on this floor infinitely until you find that one teleporter. Hang on, this seems awfully familiar, or similar rather, to uh, the windfish egg. Very similar. It's exactly like it, except instead of specific directions, you have to find one specific intersection. Now, the war mech is the beginning of a long tradition in Final Fantasy, and would also carry over onto all Square Enix games in general, of super bosses. This is the game's hidden, super powerful, super dangerous, and will probably kill you if you're not prepared super boss. This guy is harder than the final boss of the game. Interesting. Usually they leave that kind of stuff for the post-game. Nope, this guy is a random encounter, and is in fact a very rare random encounter, so... You have to be very unlucky to run into this guy unprepared. I actually had to do a couple tries of going to the previous floor, getting my step counter for an encounter in order to like bait this guy in. And so because of that, I'm using a lot of defensive spells that I wasn't using earlier, such as invisible to raise their evasion, also raise their defense, because this guy has a nuke spell, which is fire base, which will do a shit ton of damage, which luckily he didn't do. Well, it's sort of good and ungood. It's good in that my party was able to survive the fight, but it's ungood because I wasn't able to show the danger that this boss can actually possess. And instead I have Tom and Helldragon exploiting the critical hit bug. Since they're using very late game weapons, their critical hit rate is like up there in 40-50%. Nice. And instead I needed Richie, instead of using his multi-targeting medium amount heal spells, I needed it instead to focus pure cure spells on Tom and Hell Dragon. otherwise War Machine was going to wreck them. Because he's doing decent amount of damage if you can't tell. So this is probably one of the few bosses that, like, I'm not just mashing the A button and using the same options that I've been using for regular enemies. This one, you gotta watch out. And I'm glad that Squaresoft Enix decided that this was a good idea of having hidden super bosses. It's a very humble kind of robot. It's just there. It's got cannons. It's probably gonna kill you. But besides that, no agenda, really. 
Not really. I mean, he's no ruby weapon. He's no emerald weapon. Um, I think one of my personal favorites is Ozma from Final Fantasy IX. Also, Penance in Final Fantasy X. That dude is scary as fuck to actually fight. <laughs> Who's that again? Uh, Penance, you actually have to fight a lot of the Shadow Aeons, and he's just a giant force of nature that's floating in the sky, and you gotta take him down. I mean, probably more... This is more lines of, uh, to use Kingdom Hearts examples, the Sephiroth fight in Kingdom Hearts 1, where the game will tell you over and over, are you sure you want to fight this? Are you sure? Do you really want to fight this guy? You're like, yes, yes, I can do it. I totally got, like, the final key. Like, I'm ready. And then you get wiped out in the first hit. You're like, oh, I did it. No. <laughs> I don't think I've ever beaten a Sephiroth in, like, any of the games. I beat Julius in Kingdom Hearts da 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 And uh, that's only because I really, really, really like Runaway Brain, so. Nice. Also, all those opal armors that I have on Entom, that's actually a mistranslation of diamond armor, so... Tom is now diamonds. I'm fucking fabulous, bitch. All the bling, bro. Let's go, final fiend fight. Tiamat, which is, I believe is a Indo-Asian god. She's like the mother of all monsters or of all gods. So very fitting that she would be the hardest of the four fiends. And she's wind elemental. Like a bunch of Shenrons all stuck together. Yeah, she's a multi-head dragon. Her later sprites end up looking really fucking cool, but her early one, not all that good. If you have, like, set mages, like black and white, definitely use, like, their flare and holy spells that you got from Lufinia. If not, well, she resists fire, ice, and lightning, which is not too bad. I mean, I at this point, I really should have been using physical attacks with my two mages, because they were probably going to do more damage. But attack, attack, attack four times every turn looks very stupid and boring. So I instead decided to take the half damage that elements were going to inflict. If I had spells that could inflict petrify, petrify and poison, they actually do work on her and make her fight way easier. But instead, like most of the bosses I've encountered, just hit her as hard and as quickly as possible and she goes down. You just need to watch out for her multi-hit spells. She can poison your whole party. Honestly, for this point in the game, she should be a lot harder, but... Just got a deal. <laughs> yeah, I got nothing to add to this fight. I came nowhere close to reaching this point in the game. To be fair, you fought much harder fights than her. The difficulty curve actually goes down in this game. It starts pretty high early game, but as soon as all of your characters are absolute beasts, then you just hit everything really hard with a sword. Yeah. Healing off all the, this ice damage, healing off her elemental damage, it's pretty easy. Just be glad there's a Gen 1 of Pokemon where if you freeze, you're pretty much fucked without a full heal. I love how that was the most OP thing on Wi-Fi battles, cause, or not Wi-Fi, but multiplayer battles, because you can't use items. God, could you imagine Gen 1 with Wi-Fi? Ugh. Don't need that shit spreading, thank you very much. Yeah, no thanks. Also, the Mage Staff casts level 2 fire. Once again, I just wanted to give some uh, items that would give them free spells. It, it, I will admit that conserving your spell pool and only using your spells per day charges, that's very difficult to manage. So if you can find any and all of the items that will instantly give you free spells... Collect them, save them, use them. Yeah. It will make the game so much more manageable. And now we have all four of the crystals, so I assume it's back to the Chaos Shrine? Well, that you would assume that based on what we saw from the Flying Fortress, but we need to prepare. The Chaos Shrine is no easy dungeon. It is a true final dungeon, test of all your skills, even with how pretty powerful my character has been exploiting the critical hit rate and using free magic charges we still got to make sure we got at least all the spells for the audience sake and then proper items for my sake so we're going back to that one town to get the level eight magic i think you said it was not quite red mages can't actually learn level eight spells that's their final drawback is that by being so versatile 
they wear themselves a bit too thin and can't cast level 8 spells, but that's okay, we only need level 7 spells. Yeah. For being the jack of all trades, master of none, they're pretty queen in most aspects. Well, you know, the wielding fucking Molnir, I don't think you need any further spells than that. Nope. And here is a part that a lot of people miss. When you go back to the Circle of Sages, they're supposed to be your plot circle. Like, every time you defeat a fiend, you go back to them and you get hints and essential general directions on where you're supposed to go next. By beating all four fiends, they are now revealing the plot of Final Fantasy. We are now getting it. Because for the most part, it's just been, wow, the world's pretty fucked up. This one dude had a pretty sick prophecy where you were the beast heroes of everything, but it hasn't come true yet. Now we are finally getting the plot. We are finding out that the fiends actually started appearing about 2,000 years ago. And in fact, they were sent back. 2,000 years ago by some mysterious evil force. And in order to stop all the destruction and the draining of the crystals, we have to go back in time 2,000 years and stop this original evil from essentially creating a time loop cycle of the fiend sending evil back, the fiends being sent back, repeat. RPGs tend to run into a problem where they stack a lot of their story towards the end. Usually you get a little bit in the beginning to whet your appetite, bits and pieces in the middle, usually that's where the story kind of takes a little bit of a break, just to allow you to enjoy the world, I guess. And then towards the end it's like, oh, plot twist, plot twist, plot twist, finale. Exactly, especially with these early NES, but the reason I got that adamant, or adamantium from the Flying Fortress, is that it allows this one dwarf named Smithy... To create Excalibur, oh. which I will now equip to Tom. Yes, using the Ripple is all good and all, but it's nothing on top of wielding the sword of Arthurian legend. All right, come, Silver Chariot. Let's rock this shit. <laughs> I wish I could let you do wield. I really wish I could allow you to do wield, Anton, but it's not yet meant to be. Not until the ninja class gets introduced. Ah, oh, son of a bitch. Yeah, maybe I'll make Anton the... A ninja in later games. <laughs> Thank you, right? Also, when I went into the item shop, I bought 99 of all the items I could possibly get. I'm rolling in cash. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> nice. I'ma make it rain with Gil, which is, sounds kind of painful because that's literally gold coins falling on people's faces. Ouch. Don't do it. And as with the cycle of evil of the fiends and evil sending each other back in time, the game itself is going to go full cycle and we're going to enter the Chaos Shrine. <laughs> 